This is Adlink's Ampere Ultra Developer Workstation, and the model I have used to be the fastest ARM desktop in the world a couple weeks ago. This has a 96 core ARM CPU, but now they sell a 128 core version. And Apple just released the M2 Ultra Mac Pro, so this isn't the fastest in the world anymore, but it's close. And I actually doubled my performance from last video. But that video ended with a couple cliffhangers, Windows install failures, and graphics card support. Can this thing harness the power of this massive 4090? Let's start with Windows, and yes, it, it works now. A firmware upgrade was all it took to get Windows 11 Pro installed. And this isn't some janky hacked together version, this is the standard Windows on ARM installer you download from Microsoft directly. Well, sorta. I'll get to that, but I installed Windows, ran Cinebench, installed a driver for the built-in GPU, and I know what some people are already asking. Can it run Crisis? Of course it runs Crisis. It runs Steam just fine, and I got Crisis and a few other games installed. And Crisis runs just… it runs a bit slow. Well, maybe that's an understatement. Runs is being generous here, but the fact this non-x86 hardware even loads it at all playable is a pretty significant achievement. And I tried out other stuff too. I downloaded Adobe Creative Cloud, signed in, installed Photoshop, and did some of my normal raw editing workflow, and it was actually fast. Fast enough I didn't feel hampered by it. I tried running Puget Bench, but this is where you start seeing the cracks in Microsoft's approach to ARM. Creative Cloud, which admittedly isn't what I'd call good software, seems to have bugs with managing plugins under Windows on ARM. Microsoft's translation layer isn't perfect. Unlike Apple's Rosetta 2, it's a bit slower and has no hardware assist, and can't achieve the same compatibility Apple does on M-series CPUs. And drivers? Well, drivers for ARM on Linux are in a pretty good place, we'll get to that shortly. But drivers for ARM on Windows? That's, that's a whole different story. Let's start with installing Windows. At this point, there are a dozen or so ARM Windows desktops. Heck, Microsoft even makes one, the Windows Dev Kit 2023, their Project Volterra that I already covered. There's also the Surface and other Windows ARM laptops. So why doesn't Microsoft have an easily downloadable ARM image for Windows? I don't know. I had to go to uupdump.net, download an ARM64 Windows 11 Insider Preview build, use a Windows PC to flash that to a USB drive using Rufus, and then I had my installer ready. Ampere has their own guide for this process, because you can't find ARM64 Windows at all on Microsoft's website. The Windows installation media tool doesn't support ARM, and the Windows 11 download page only shows x64 ISOs. Anyway, I created an installer and plugged it in. Last video, it would just crash during boot, but since then, Adlink released version 10 of the firmware with a UEFI bug fix, and now Windows can install just like any other PC. And just like other PCs, I still ran into the idiotic Microsoft account requirement. Seriously, who in their right mind would be this pushy about requiring a cloud account just to log into your local computer? Yeah, you can get around it by unplugging your network before installing, then pressing Shift F10, then typing a bunch of gibberish in the console, then clicking all kinds of dumb prompts that make you feel like an idiot, and yes, I know Rufus can also bypass the nag, but that's not the point. It's still dumb. Uh, sorry about that. Let's turn the rant mode off. But now we have a Windows 11 install running native on this thing. Neat. Except the graphics are a bit wonky. I fixed that by installing this A-speed driver, and now I can get HD resolution through the tiny chip on the motherboard. I should note the driver is pre-release. A-speed is working on getting it certified, so hopefully it'll be public soon. This little A-speed chip isn't going to burn rubber in the latest racing game, but it can render windows at 60Hz just fine. At this point, I wanted to start testing a bunch of things. <laughs> All the things. And there were a lot of highlights, like Firefox. It has a completely native ARM build for Windows, so it's blazing fast on this machine. And unlike tiny single board computers, this thing could play 4K content on YouTube all day with no dropped frames. But how about some harder things? Well, one problem that's not specific to this hardware is there are very few things optimized for Windows on ARM. It's a chicken and egg problem. But even something that's not well optimized can be passable if you just throw 100 CPU cores at it. Like Cinebench. This benchmark is actually one of the worst scenarios because it's optimized completely for x86, not ARM. A lot of routines just aren't even in the ARM architecture. But even so, with all 96 cores going full blast, this computer still chews through renders. 
Of course, the end result is barely faster than some older desktop chips, but that's running under emulation. But another thing I found is while I was running this test, I ran into a strange issue you'll only see with high-end workstation or server CPUs like this one. Windows traditionally doesn't know what to do with more than like 32 cores. In fact, until recently in Windows 10, you had to buy a special Enterprise Windows Edition just to address more than 60 cores on a CPU. But that assumption in Windows means a lot of apps don't scale beyond a few dozen cores. Like, by default, Cinebench only used 60 cores. I had to go into the BIOS and change the CPU core ANC mode from monolithic to quadrant to get all 96 cores in use. I won't get into the details of what all that means, mostly because I'm not an expert on CPU architecture, but the bottom line is there are trade-offs. Like in the default monolithic mode, which works great with all the Linux tests I ran, Windows only ever shows apps 60 CPU cores at a time. And strangely, I could sometimes get higher scores on monolithic only hitting 60 cores than with Quadrant running on all 96. Why is that? Well, this is partly speculation, but the different modes make CPU caches work a little differently. With so many little CPU cores, the processor's built-in L2 and L3 caches are routed differently, and with hyper-focused software like Cinebench, my best guess is some routines that are optimized for x86 kind of blow up when they get to ARM processors. So the problem could actually get worse if you go full steam on all the cores. And that's a good transition to Steam on Windows. Steam must have updated recently, because the first time I was testing this in April, I actually had some UI issues, but those are gone now. It loads and lets me install and run games just fine. But not all games work. In fact, most of the older games I tried had issues, like Star Wars Pod Racer tried installing a 32-bit DirectX version, uh, but then it would just die and not start up. Quake 3 Arena would open, but then the console would pop up warning OpenGL couldn't load. Some of this might be down to running on ARM, and other things because ARM graphics drivers in Windows barely exist, but in either case, there are a lot of apps and games that won't work yet, or might even never work. But one app that should work, but I've had trouble with, is Geekbench. Geekbench 6 actually gave a result, but while I was monitoring CPU cores, it seemed like most of the multi-core tests would only hit 60 cores at a time. I could even see that just by power usage. During Geekbench runs, I never saw more than about 170 watts of power use, even though during Linux benchmarking it would get up past 220 watts. On the Linux side, all 96 cores worked, so it might just be like Windows libraries that aren't expecting so many cores. Again, not sure. I actually opened a support request with Geekbench to try to figure out the problem. Jumping over from games to general 3D graphics, the Heaven benchmark won't run at all because DirectX 11 couldn't find a GPU. Which is fair, since the little A-speed doesn't do 3D graphics at all. But anything that relies on 3D rendering isn't going to work until graphics cards are supported for Windows on ARM. And I don't see any timeline for that yet. I think Qualcomm likes it that way because right now the only way to really get 3D acceleration on Windows on ARM is with their chips. Anyway, I spent a good deal of time day to day in Windows and for general productivity like web browsing and even photo editing in Photoshop, this thing could be my daily driver, no problem. I just hope Microsoft keeps investing in Windows on ARM and convinces the rest of the world it actually matters. There are a lot of device drivers that just won't work in Windows, like the basic Intel Gigabit Ethernet driver. I had to use this external USB adapter because that's actually supported for Windows on ARM laptops and tablets. But doing a 180, I'm going to switch back to Linux, because that's where this machine really shines. First off, I didn't mention, but early in my testing, I upgraded the system from 4 sticks of 16 gig ECC RAM to 6 sticks, meaning I went from 64 to 96 gigs of RAM. You wouldn't think it, but that actually made a huge difference in performance. I got about 400 gigaflops with 64 gigs and 600 with 96, and Geekbench went from 30,000 to almost 36,000. Power usage jumped up a bit too. I actually did a double take and had to test out both my kilowatt and the Sonoff S31 adapter, but both were within a watt of each other. With 4 sticks of RAM, I was seeing about 200 watts of power draw under load. Putting in 2 more sticks and changing nothing else, the system used 235 watts. That's a 35 watt difference. A stick of DDR ECC RAM uses maybe 5 or 6 watts, so 2 should just add 10 or 15 watts max. Where's the other 15 watts coming from? Well, I'm leaving out some of the details here, but basically this massive CPU has 8 memory channels and the COM HPC carrier where the CPU sits has six memory slots. Each memory slot goes to a single channel. 
the more channels you fill, the more faster the CPU can access memory. And what I'm guessing is happening is the CPU is activating more memory channels, thus consuming more power. But with great power comes a lot more performance in this case. And in this case, I could even eke out more gigaflops, in my case 985 of them, by using an Ampere-optimized math library instead of compiling a more generic one. I followed these directions to install a special library to use with Linpack, and doing that I could get 985 gigaflops using 270 watts of wall power. That means performance efficiency for this machine went from 2 to 3.64 gigaflops per watt, which is nearly as good as my Apple M1 Max. Not bad. But we've been talking a lot about the CPU. I left off the last video just hinting at GPU support. Windows on ARM has pretty much no support, but in Linux, support is already good and getting better over time. I tested my 3080 Ti extensively under Ubuntu, and I can confirm a 4090 just barely fits in the system, but because the power supply isn't quite a thousand watts, I didn't want to risk overloading it. So 3080 it is. Just like for installing Windows, Ampere has a whole guide for how to install NVIDIA's graphics card drivers on Linux, and it worked well for me. I didn't even have to recompile the Linux kernel, I just installed the ARM drivers from NVIDIA's website. And with a graphics card speeding things up, now I can get over 100 frames per second in Super Tux Cart on Mac settings. I also ran GLMark2 and I could get a score just under 10,000. Then I followed Ampere's instructions to install Doom 3, or, or well, Doom 3, the open source version. And running that, I was getting a perfect 60 FPS the whole time. I could probably get a lot more, but for some reason it was locked to the monitor refresh rate. And when I tried running the built-in benchmark, it seg faulted and crashed. So then I installed Open Arena, which is a little older, but based on a similar older engine. On a little overclocked Raspberry Pi 4, I could get 90 FPS. On this machine, it maxed out the engine at 1000 FPS, but it's more stable locked at a lower frame rate, something like a more reasonable 500 FPS. This is a silly example, but it just shows how modern GPUs can run even older games just fine as long as you have driver support. <coughs> Windows. But speaking of Windows, Steam ran just fine there. O over in Ubuntu, I couldn't get it to launch at all. I got this exec format error, which means Linux tried launching Steam but kind of blew up because Steam is only compiled for x86 on Linux. And since Linux doesn't have an x86 translation layer, like Rosetta 2 or Microsoft's WoW64 engine, Steam won't launch at all. And I tried launching the Heaven benchmark too, but the same thing happened there. I won't hold my breath for Valve or other 3D graphics companies to support ARM natively, but that doesn't mean a fast GPU isn't already useful for ARM machines like this one. Machine learning apps like Stable Diffusion and Llama run just fine here, <laughs> although the first time I tried I completely screwed up my CUDA install to the point I had to reinstall Ubuntu just to get my drivers working again. There's a lot to look forward to here though. Microsoft showed off the Unity engine running natively on Windows on ARM recently, and ARM showed off a bunch of game-related developments at Mobile World Congress 23. And what about AMD GPUs? It looks like they'll actually work too, but right now it does require a kernel patch since the AMD drivers still run into cache coherency issues on ARM. That's actually one of the problems I ran into on the Raspberry Pi as well, though the Ampere's PCI Express bus, all 192 lanes of PCIe Gen 4, is a lot more robust than the single Gen 2 lane on the Pi. So where do we go from here? <laughs> well, obviously we go faster. Subscribe because I'm gonna do a live stream where I upgrade this beast from 96 cores all the way to 128, and we'll rerun the top 500 benchmark and see if we can break a teraflop. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.